Good morning. Today we'll be talking about the prediction and understanding of extreme linear events in the Eastern Pacific using deep learning. This is work with uh, Gerardo Rivera Tello and Cristina Caramperito. So firstly, um, Peru is located on the Eastern Pacific and uh, it's typically cool, the coast is cool, associated with coastal upwelling, but during El Nino, these cool conditions can be transformed into a very warm and wet um, climate. And as you can see in the plots on the time series on the, on the right-hand side, during El Nino, particularly like in 1998 and 1983, we had very warm and very wet conditions associated with severe rainfall and flooding. And on the left-hand side, you can see the maps of sea surface temperature anomalies, which show that the warming during these events extended from the coast of Peru all the way along the equatorial Pacific to the central Pacific. Now, the, the details of the pattern of the warming are very important for the impacts. If we look just at the Nino 3.4 index, and the, the associated uh, anomalies tend to be wet on the northwestern coast and dry along the, the rest of the Peruvian con uh, territory. But if we just focus on the Central Pacific warming or the Asian Pacific warming as depicted in the top here by these uh, principal component patterns, the C pattern and the E pattern, with the Central Pacific warming, we have predominantly warm conditions, uh, sorry, dry conditions on the territory. And during the warm Eastern Pacific events, we have wet conditions in the northwestern part of the country. So most of the events are going to be a combination of these two patterns, and the details of the impacts are going to depend on the, the specifics of how much of these two contribute. Now, the predictions for, for the El Nino, for the Eastern Pacific, have the problem that the, the, the model skills tend to be low, as we can see in this uh, example from the 2017 coastal El Nino, which was very intense in terms of flooding in northwestern Peru. And we can see that the, the sea surface temperature anomalies peaked in March 2017, but even the, the model predictions initialized in January that same year were unable to, to represent the, the full extent of the, of the event. Now, if we fo focus not on the, the, the patterns produced by the models themselves, but on their internal patterns, as depicted, for instance, by principal component analysis or the ENC patterns. These can represent more accurately the, the intrinsic dynamics of ENSO in these models. And uh, how these, the different patterns, the ENC or the principal components one to relate to each other can also help us identify which models are more realistic, even if their biases affect the spatial pattern. So if the models could have re relatively realistic dynamics, but the patterns might be very different from each other and from observations. If we focus on the extreme El Nino in the Eastern Pacific, the by definition, the, the Eastern Pacific will have very strong warming, as shown by the E index. But also, before that, we tend to have weak uh, precursor warming in the Central Pacific. We also have weak um, positive heat content anomalies in the, along the equatorial Pacific, and a somewhat more consistent westerly wind precursors are also along the central equatorial Pacific. Now, if we know these uh, predictors, how do we go from this to an actual prediction model that can have more, uh, more skill than the actual global, uh, global climate models? So the key questions were, Focus here are what are the precursors of the extreme El Nino in the Eastern Pacific that are most relevant for prediction? And how can we take advantage of these to produce more skillful operational predictions? And our approach is to develop a deep learning model trained on the global SST, heat content and surface winds from global climate models and observations to produce the skillful predictions of E and C, the indices in nature. And then to use explainable artificial intelligence techniques to identify the sources of the predictive skill in this uh, deep learning model to guide our scientific understanding. And with that, I'll hand over to Gerardo. Okay, so thanks, Ken. Continuing the presentation, here we present the architecture of the convolutional neural, neural network uh, with a few remarks on its design and what it's capable of doing. So this model is focused on the prediction of extreme Asian Pacific El Nino events, which are defined by having an E-index above 1.5 in January. 
For the inputs, we have a near global sea surface temperature, heat content, surface zonal and meridional wind anomalies for the times uh, t, t minus one and t minus two. This means that for each one of the variables, we have three times, that will be four times three. In total, we have 12 channels as the inputs. And for the output, we have the E and C indices for different lead times going from one to 23, and the probability of an extreme uh, Eastern Pacific El Nino in the following January, that is within a 12 month lead. And we also have kept the seasonality as an output like Ham did in, in his model in 2019 or in 2021, but instead of doing a classification problem with um, seasonality, we are using uh, harmonics. Uh, above the diagram of the neural network architecture, we uh, can see a, a sample of the input data. So we can see a bit more clearly how uh, the data is, is going in the model. And what we are getting out of the model as an output is the time series with different lead times plus the probability of extreme events, like I mentioned previously. So going now over the data ingested and the data installation and the data training, we may use of semi-6 historical runs of 16 models with up to three members. These models were not selected randomly. We follow the work of, of Chai, where these models are shown to have realistic answer variability. So for the actual data sets, um, we are showing this table here, and the total amount of samples that we have are nearly 48,000. So there's quite a good amount of data. So we have the train set. This train set uh, is approximately 58% of the total data. It's composed of the member one of 16 models plus the member two of 10 models. The Dev one, which actually will be kind of a validation as it, so but we're calling here the one is used for the early stopping. Uh, we're using this as a regularization method, and it's composed of the member two of five models, as uh, member three of three models, and is the sixty percent of the data. So we can see well, the same detail for the other sets. Uh, I'm just going to explain them like the major details. The Dev two set uh, we're using or we're actually calling it the set uh, uh, hyperparameter or architecture tuning set. Um, uh, we are using to compute the metrics and perform multiple tests to determine uh, the best architecture of, of the model. Um, the last one is the test set that we are reserving to do a proper fully disconnected evaluation of the model. By this, uh, we mean that this set will be no use whatsoever on deciding which part of the model we have to tune to improve the accuracy. It's kind of an independent test that we are uh, yet to use since we are seen developing some parts of, of the model. Uh, we have the plot of the loss function during the training stage and um, with a, a depth one uh, where we can see a um, red dash line. This indicates where the model did not learn anything more. The early stopping has a parameter of a patient. In this case, we're using 40 epoch patients. The first metric we will focus our attention on is the prediction scale, uh, being the correlation coefficient for each lead time. On the plot on the left, we have uh, the, the scale for all initial conditions combined, so we can have a look on how the model is performing overall. We have a greater scale for uh, longer ranges uh, for the C index than the index. However, and if we focus our attention on some particular initial conditions, like uh, May, the skill for the index uh, in December, January is slightly in, in haste. That is uh, around the lead 8 and 9. But since the model has a, an output for a classification problem for extreme events, we are using the predictions to compute a, a confusion matrix for the extreme uh, Eastern Pacific El Nino uh, classification, which is the matrix that we're showing here on, on the left. Uh, here we have a CSI or critical score index of 0.5. So to compare this output, we also use the uh, index that comes from the model output. That will be the predicted e index. And we apply the same condition um, that we used initially to, to define our 
classification, right? That that will be that e index has to be above one point five in January, and with um, May initial condition. So by doing the classification again with the predicted e values, we have this confusion matrix with a CSI of uh, 0.52. At first glance, uh, when looking at the matrix, this might indicate that the regression output tends to misclassify more non-events with 30 occurrences uh, compared to 13 occurrences for the classification output. To further analyze what's happening inside this model, we may use of the layer wash relevance propagation method on its composite variant to provide a relevance maps that indicate most important features for prediction, being able to precisely attribute negative relevance score to class contradicting features. Uh, this method has been selected since it has been shown that it has quite decent performance when applied to our sciences problem in machine learning, as showing Mamalaki is at all in his paper in 2022. He actually compares some XAI methods. Um, well, this is the one with, that we choose for our problem. We then composite the input data and the relevance mass for different L, L linear classes. So we will showing only the two positive cases here. So shifting our attention to the graphic on the right, since we are going to see some maps that have uh, this structure. Uh, the shading are the LRP attributions. Um, the red colors identify map regions where regions contribute to the prediction of a linear class, while on the opposite side, the blue regions provide opposing evidences. Well, the, comp the contrast overlay show the mean of the input data, so we can combine the two sets of information to find out what, what's happening when the model decides on the class problem. So we are trying to understand the predictors of the correct predictions of extreme specific El Nino in the following January. It will be the true positive cases. Uh, we have on the right uh, the lead for the current month, that will be May. Um, going backwards, we have April and March, so we can see the time evolution of the attributions for each uh, one of the variables. One first quick observation that we can make is that the relative importance of the positive equatorial uh, sea surface temperature anomalies is smaller in general than for the sonar wind and heat content, as you can clearly see in this equatorial uh, region on the heat content and the uh, sonar wind. The northward wind anomalies in the uh, sound Eastern Pacific favor extreme Eastern Pacific uh, El Nino, which is consistent with previous studies uh, on this topic. Regions in blue marks um, for all, or are unfavorable in general for the uh, conversion of neural network to predict an El Nino event. Although their significance right now is it's quite unclear. To summarize what we have presented, <clears throat> we developed a, a combined regression and classification deep learning model that is trained on global sea surface temperature, heat content, and surface wind from CIMIC-SIP models. An observation that is able to produce uh, skillful predictions of extreme Eastern Pacific El Nino events in the cimip -C models with a critical score index of, of 0.5 for eight month leads. The preliminary results with the explainable AI methods identify some precursors to extreme Eastern Pacific El Nino uh, that are quite consistent with some of those of previous study. So we have here the equatorial westerly wind, the positive sea surface temperature, the positive heat content, southeastern Pacific, and northward wind anomalies. So ground truthing in the testing phase of the observations is it required to assess the validity of these methods for extracting relevance, relevant mechanisms in nature because as of now we are just sticking to use the CMIP6 data. Um, the next step regarding this topic will be to do the transfer learning and the testing, the sensitivity and optimization via ensemble modeling, which will provide kind of a more robust uh, or more statistically robust result. That is for everything for this presentation. Thank you for your attention. Gobierno del Perú Bicentenario del Perú 2024